So I'm going to share my screen for a couple of minutes here, uh, and then uh, we should be ready. Okay. So um, welcome to this session. So we are going to have um, uh, project updates today. So uh, as we wrote in the agenda um, that you can probably see here, um, what we're going to do is go through two halves, right? So there'll be one half where we're talking about what um, the existing uh, participants have been doing in the first half of the semester. Okay, um, so we'll have updates about 10 minutes each from each of the different projects, okay, that are around. And um, then after that, all, all of you in, the, um, in that part are, are welcome to stay, but uh, if you would like to have an early day off from lecture, um, or I guess seminar, then you can uh, go. And then only the first year PhD students in the second lab rotation <clears throat> will um, stay with me to talk about uh, their projects and ideation. Okay, so that's what we're going to do today. Let me just uh, make sure that's going right. Looks like it's okay. All right, <clears throat> that is pretty much uh, what I wanted to go over with uh, all of us. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. In the second half, uh, I will uh, do some introduction about what um, this lab rotation is um, for, especially for those of you who are attending just for the first time. So you're entering uh, this course in the middle, um, and uh, you know you, we will see how the other projects are going. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Those of you attending a sixty one hundred one for the second lab rotation, I want you to take some notes about how the different projects are going so that you have some idea of what's going on. Okay, so um, you can follow through on the projects channel over here, um, what your seniors or, or your peers have been doing um, by looking through their slide decks that they've attached uh, in, in their own threads. So um, without further ado, uh, let's stick to the order that's uh, specified here. So um, are there any uh, people from our um, diversifying dialogue generation with non-conversational text participants? Yeah, here. Okay, so uh, you're welcome to share when you're ready and give us an update. And um, uh, if you can go to your thread and just bump it uh, by putting uh, just a message and uh, sending it to the project's thread so that everyone else can uh, easily locate your um, slide deck. Yeah, so I think it's this one here. Um, so if, if you guys have updated, that's great. If not, uh, you can just uh, bump it or just add a new, a new set of slides. So um, everyone can add their comments, uh, whatever they like to write on the thread itself. Okay, when you're ready, uh, you can start. You have about 10 minutes in total. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, so for us, uh, this time round, right, uh, like, uh, what, what we have rather than, than the updates is, is more of a template of, of what exactly our project is about, uh, it's, it's actually meant for the, uh, 6101, uh, the, the, the students of the second half. So um, it, it's, not, it's not exactly an update, but more of a, a summary of what uh, our project is and some of uh, uh, like, uh, what were some of the com comments, uh, things that we learned from, from this. Uh, yeah. Great. So without further ado, let, uh, let me just go right into it. So uh, yeah, our, our project is 
is this um, is on diversifying our dialogue generation with uh, non-conversational text. Okay, yeah. So uh, basically, basically for for this paper, uh, what the authors uh, intend to do is is to try and augment uh, the traditional kind of um, a dialogue that is generated because uh, with pre-trained, uh, with, with all of those uh, pre-trained uh, dialogue generation models, uh, they seem to come out with a relatively uh, mundane kind of responses and uh, res responses that tend to be uh, really short. So what the authors uh, thought about doing is they, they wanted to uh, diversify the dialogue that's being generated by using a uh, certain non-conversational text. And uh, the data set which they, they are using on is uh, certain uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese conversational Chinese data sets from uh, basically poems and, and good uh, uh, po poems and uh, some of the comments from a uh, uh, Chinese uh, microblogging site, uh, Weibo. So, um, those those generally um, is is what they have done. But uh, what we wanted to do is to extend this work uh, to data sets that are in English. So in in general, yes, uh, that's right. Yep. It, so so in general, uh, that's that's what we intend to do. And another aspect that we wanted to explore is. Uh, based on the type of non-conversational corpus uh, that is being added on to, uh, uh, to, to, to augment this, this base of conversational data set. And uh, we wanted to see if whether, if we filtered the corpus based on topic, like how would it um, affect the, the results of the model itself? Yes. So uh, this, uh, this is our code, uh, code base, like, um, yeah, this is our GitHub link. You can feel free to click on it uh, or, yep. Uh, then uh, what we have like two main models for, for our project. The first one is uh, a sequence to sequence model that, uh, that is the, the part which acts as the main uh, translation translation portion, uh, dialogue generation portion. And um, that is done through uh, a few steps. So the first, first steps is to initialize it and then to, to train, train this uh, sequ uh, sequence to sequence model uh, iteratively using uh, a backward pass as well as a, 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 forward, a forward one. And, uh, and the, other, the other part that that uh, the other component of, of this, this main project uh, is a uh, bird-based uh, sentence uh, classification model. So uh, why, why we are using uh, this sentence classification model is so that we are able to filter the non-conversational uh, data according to the topics that we are interested in. And, uh, and yeah, that's, that's mainly about what exactly it is. So in terms of the data sets that we use, uh, we use, uh, I'll, I'll talk about the conversational data sets first. So the, the main conversational data sets that, that we use is uh, this data set called uh, Daily Dialog. Uh, so uh, this is a sample of the, in, the data that is present in the Daily Dialog. So, so one, one thing about Daily Dialog is that it's actually a, uh, multi-turn uh, data set, but uh, essentially essentially for these purposes, for the purposes of uh, our this project, we are essentially trying to um, make it into a two-turn kind of data set. So uh, yeah, so, so basically uh, we, we had to do some pre-processing for that. Yep, so uh, yeah. So, so uh, we actually ran our, ran our bird-based uh, topic uh, classifier. Uh, we, we trained uh, the bird-based uh, topic classifier on this uh, daily dialogue set. And uh, when, we, 
when we try to put in all of the data from from uh, all uh, all all topics which are present in daily dialogue, we actually uh, got quite quite a low score of a uh, 62 percent, which which is not which is not good enough for for us to be able to uh, classify uh, sentences in our non-conversational data set uh, uh, well enough. And yep, and, and uh, this this is actually the point when we when we thought about uh, whether we wanted to uh, this this actually motivated us to to see whether we um, we we wanted to uh, further filter and and this this really proves our hypothesis that probably if if we further filtered the the um, the the data like if we train a classifier uh, not on not on uh, all of the, the classes, all of the, uh, in, in this particular data set, we would probably uh, be able to have a topic classifier that works reasonably well. So uh, that's, that's the reason why we chose to focus on uh, uh, three, three, different, uh, three different topics of the topics of politics, health, uh, and uh, attitude and emotion. And uh, uh, yeah, and and we we got a better classifier uh, in in the end. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So so I'll uh, I'll pass on to Tianzhen, uh, who will bring you through a bit more on the non-compositional data sets. So yeah, th thanks. Uh, well, I'll, I'll be covering the non-conversational part, uh, because in the past two weeks, we, uh, we mainly focused on this part and we were trying to process this, this data set here. And uh, actually at, at the very beginning of this project, we found the ELI-5 data set, uh, which, is, which contains a lot of different topics there. So it actually, we, we actually got very, poor performance out of this data set. So we turned our direction. We uh, tried to find different types of, uh, different topics of uh, 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 data sets, the politics, health, and attitude emotions. So basically we, we, we now found around 1 million pieces of data here. And in politics, we have Trump tweets from 2006 to 2007. And uh, well, the, the tweets are actually very badly formatted. So we need to remove all the unnecessary parts like the mentions, the hashtags, and uh, some HTML mark, markup tags, things like that. And uh, we also found a very high quality data set, the United States pres presentational, uh, presentation and relation speeches. And we actually create this data set from scratch. Uh, we, uh, we, we just mm, selected the sentences from the very original text there. So although it's very small size, but it's very high quality and can really diversify our generated dialogue. And in terms of the health part, uh, because we have very limited to limited access to this kind of uh, topic. Uh, we, we cannot find a, a lot of data in this topic. So we only find this medical NLP, uh, which is su su suitable for our project, which is very small, but well, there's a problem here. So in our, so in this uh, data set, it contains the patient descriptions uh, and it contains very professional medical terminologies, which is quite different from the the health topic in our um, in our conversational data set. So we we actually need to deal with this problem. And uh, in terms of the attitude and emotion, the sen sentiment one hundred and forty is actually it, it is also a Twitter data sets, so we need to deal with the same problem as the Trump tweets. Yeah, that's it.
So I'll pass to Yuxi to talk about the next part. Okay, so um, for uh, evaluation, uh, currently uh, we only use the um, blue forward to um, to evaluate how our model performs. So um, next, uh, we will utilize the um, automatic metrics like diversity and uh, uh, use human evaluation to see whether uh, our method uh, really improved the performance. Uh, okay, so next. Uh, okay, so this is the preliminary result for um, our model. And, uh, and, and Tian Zhen says, um, currently we only have the uh, results and uh, that's uh, how when, when incorporating the data sets uh, like ELI5, how the uh, model performance change. So um, actually uh, uh, one thing to mention is that uh, after uh, we have get the translation of our model, we find that um, because of the update of the version um, of the library we use, uh, and that is to say the transformers and the results of the tokenization uh, has been changed. So, uh, so uh, in this case, I want to um, tell all of you uh, who want to use um, the transformer library um, as your uh, as your auxiliary uh, as your um, uh, library, and uh, you need to um, pay attention to this version change because um, when you uh, input the the text you want to um, to tokenize, the text should be in the form of um, list, uh, the list of words, not the uh, string. So so if you just input the um, string, then the 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 results will um, tokenize the sentence into letters, not um, to not tokens. Yes. So um, for the results of uh, our model on the daily dialogue. Uh, this is the result on the validation data set. So uh, we can see that actually, even for the uh, model trained only on the non-conversational data, uh, a trained only on, on the conversational data, the blue uh, is not that high. This is because we um, we, we, we just um, process the multi-turn dialogue into um, two-turn pairs. So the information the information is not that enough to um, generate a, a re 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 related utterance. So, uh, so the blue is um, just a little bit low here. Um, but uh, when we incorporate the non-conversational data like ELI5, uh, even the blue uh, decrease. But uh, here is an example below that show that uh, actually uh, incorporating corpus like the LI5 can diversify the uh, the count the content of the utterance here. So for this example, um, the input context is that um, a, a one is asked about the job, the experience of job. But for the for the one without non-conversational data, it just generates a, a general general answer um, that can be applied to. Um, even all of the questions, but for the ELI5, at least uh, it can uh, say that uh, the question is asked about a uh, job. So um, there may be competition in this uh, context. So uh, it generates the first sentence saying, uh, uh, saying about competition um, about the job. So uh, we think that uh, and it's, uh, it has, uh, in some cases, um, proved that it's uh, useful to incorporate non-conversational data into the uh, dialogue system. Yes, next. And so um, there are our contributions and uh, how we organize the work for uh, different people in our group. So uh, actually there are many kinds of data set for us to process so we, uh, so we um, assign two persons to um, complete this kind of job. And uh, for the uh, model implementation, uh, in implementation I, I have done uh, most of the work and uh, um, because um, the model may have some bugs and uh, 
we also need to train and see whether the performance can be uh, improved um, by tuning the parameters. So um, and Qi Xun and Tian Zhen uh, has uh, completed the model debugging and training uh, in this case. So next. Okay, so um, there is our uh, advice for uh, you in the uh, second part of the laboratory. So, um, so uh, how about you guys um, talk about uh, your advice in turn? I think, hi, Chi Xun. Yeah, okay, so, uh, so I'll start first. So uh, my main advice is really uh, as start small, so uh, don't don't dive right away into uh, something uh, deep and uh, complex. So really just start off with a small baseline first before uh, you you incrementally add stuff on. Uh, like like the reason behind it is because uh, it's it's easier to to uh, make uh, something small larger, but it's it's a lot harder to to try and make. Uh, something large small so uh yep so so you should you should probably uh start start with something small first and uh next is uh plan well i think like <laughs> both uh most uh like like you see also like covered the same point right? it's, it's very important to to uh start planning about all of your uh, about what what uh you each and every one of you should should be doing then uh yeah basically execute execute the plan or if you fail to plan you plan to fail yep so uh yep Hansen. Oh, okay so uh i, I just want to say get involved in your lectures in your project teams in uh, many other thing activities and uh, just get exposed to what you're not familiar with, uh, you you might not want to get stuck to what you have done in the past. So you're it's a laboratory. You're you're supposed to get exposed to different things. Uh, yeah, that's it. Mm, okay, so um, for me, I think firstly, um, uh, one important thing is about the model implementation. So. Uh, if you want to uh, adapt uh, some um, um, project like the report in, on the GitHub, so you need to make sure that you are familiar with the codes and uh, um, because uh, if you run the, the codes that you are, not, uh, you are not familiar with, then you may spend a lot of time to debug. And uh, uh, oh, okay, yes, yes, I, I agree with me, yes. Um, sometimes the time of debugging is ca cannot be um, cannot be approximized. So, so you need to make sure you are familiar with the codes. And the uh, second, like uh, Qi Xun said, um, we need to plan well. So, for our group, we actually have a virtual meeting uh, every week, and uh, um, this uh, this allows us to um, uh, this allows everyone to. Um, be familiar with the work uh, and uh, our uh, current progress and uh, make sure that we can adjust our plan if uh, we, 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 we found that there are some problems or uh, the, the things we plan cannot be completed. Uh, so um, the last one is that um, the, the most important thing I think is the communication and the collaboration. So uh, actually, um, 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 besides the um, week, uh, besides the weekly meeting, uh, we also uh, will uh, update our progress um, um, in time. Uh, like we have the um, GitHub, so uh, when we have some updates in the codes, and we will um, push it on the GitHub, so everyone can see it, and we can, and we will also uh, mention it in the WeChat. So, uh, so this uh, make us. Um, communicate well and uh, make everyone know uh, what is happening and what is the uh, current progress. Yes, so um, then it's the uh, about the discussion. So um, so in a group, maybe there is someone that's uh, not quite familiar with the topic and there is someone that uh, is 
quite skilled at it. So uh, it's important um, for us to uh, ask questions uh, that we are not sure about uh, to uh, and uh, uh, discuss about it in the group. So this can make us learn more and uh, uh, get more familiar with our project. So that's all. Thanks. Okay, everyone. So uh, that was a very great uh, report. I think it contained a lot of very useful tips, uh, especially technical as well as project management tips to all the teams that are currently going through uh, midway through, especially our DYOM students, uh, but also for the new 6101 students uh, who are just starting their second lab rotation. Uh, so let's thank uh, all of them. Shichun, uh, Tenchen, and uh, Yishi for presenting. Okay, uh, so uh, you may want to take a note. I mean, Slack has this save the items uh, uh, thing that you can do. You know, you can star or, or save their, their deck slides so that um, your, yourself or your project team can uh, take note of their, their advice. Okay, um, now going back to our... Uh, session, we have a number of different groups uh, going. So the second group is the counterfactual recommendation and search systems. Um, do we have anyone from that group around? Hi, Pro. Yeah, uh, hi, Taka. Uh, hi. Yourself, right? Yeah, uh, so. okay. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, uh, yeah. Can you see the screen now? Yep. Okay, yeah, so, okay, yeah, let me start from uh, our group's update. So, yeah, uh, I am the editor working for kind of a, a causal recommendation, unbiased recommended, recommender search system, especially from the causal inference point of view approach. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is just a recap. So, the originally our starting point is, yeah, uh, uh, this academic paper written by uh, Saito. Uh, this is a yeah, unbiased pairwise learning from bias implicit feedback. So basically, the uh, this paper's idea is to like incorporate with uh, implicit feedback. Uh, so implicit feedback is uh, somewhat biased because user uh, user only see uh, like a kind of a popular item or recommended item too. Uh, so even though we have a quick activity, yeah, this data is already biased. So biased. So, so even though we built a machine learning model, uh, we should have a biased result because target variable is already biased. So this paper is to address how to deep bias uh, uh, and provide a better recommendation for user by uh, only using a implicit feedback training data. Yeah. Uh, so the, yeah. And uh, so currently, uh, actually, uh, last of two weeks, uh, we are still have, like making efforts to like find find the like proper direction to improvement. So uh, two weeks back, uh, we like uh, we were thinking of to like find a better way to estimate the propensity score. So basically, the original paper is like introducing a propensity score in order to kind of a discounting popular content so that our model's uh, loss function can be like fairly evaluated uh, regardless of this popular app is contains popular or not. And uh, yeah, actually I read a, a couple of uh, academic papers associated with uh, propensity score est estimation. Some people use using some uh, ex uh, expected uh, EM algorithm, uh, regression EM algorithm, and also another paper Proposing a dual learning, uh, dual learning algorithm is to like train uh, not only kind of a uh, loss, loss function that we defined, but also uh, training a like propensity score. I think this concept is similar to EM algorithm, like uh, optimizing a uh, propensity score, then uh, using this propensity score to uh, do model training for minimizing other function and uh, just just keep iterating uh, these approaches and so uh, originally uh, I was thinking uh, if we could integrate this estimation approach for uh, our our research project but uh, uh, eventually I came to think that the 
uh, it might be hard to apply because the uh, this research uh, like done uh, especially for like search systems which has uh, not only have a like a kind of a click through rate activity but also the they have some like a uh, how they say like position information like for, for example in search system they a such system returns the like position like this is a fa uh, first rank recommended item and this is a second uh, recommended item and so on. So the uh, it might be a bit uh, tricky to yeah apply this approach into like our data set. Uh, this is a kind uh, for recommendation system. So uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, still thinking, yeah, if we could, yeah, uh, uh, because, uh, sorry, uh, because the, uh, so currently we, we are thinking to use a data set, so-called Yahoo Music and the Code. Uh, they are kind of a data set based on the kind of a recommendation. For example, Yahoo Music, this is a, like a music recommendation systems outcome. And, uh, uh, but basically what they have is, the, they have a kind of a, uh, explicit rating uh, information ranging from one to five, but uh, uh, I think this data set doesn't include any kind of a, a specific, uh, specific uh, ranking for user. So what we have is uh, just user ID and uh, our item rating uh, in each user. So so actually we, uh, we, we don't know like how much this content is recommend, like what is a uh, original ranking to uh, recommend to each uh, specific user. So uh, given this situation, so uh, even though dual learning, especially dual learning approach seems to be interesting, but uh, it might be hard to like uh, apply this approach directly. So yeah. But, but uh, yeah, I'm still thinking how we can do this. But uh, at the same time, the uh, in case that this approach doesn't work, I also like exploring another direction uh, by by reading another paper. Uh, this is a uh, also a paper written by Saito and uh, presented in last year Alexis. Uh, this paper is uh, kind of a it's so called doubly robust estimator for ranking metrics. Uh, so actually, this paper is is uh, like a uh, dealing with an, uh, well, slightly different uh, problem statement, but uh, using a same uh, same data set, Yahoo Music and the Code, and uh, this approach is uh, kind of is a uh, like slightly different. Uh, we are originally thinking of uh, not not just the est like uh, estimating a propensity score, but this research is to Introducing a uh, like like a new new way to like a calculate a loss function by introducing a doubly robust estimator. So, uh, in previous paper, uh, I'm still learning to. Oops, ah, sorry. Uh, in previous paper, so called the unbiased pairs learning from vanity implicit feedback. Uh, this paper is to like uh using a propensity score as a uh, 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 dis discounting factor. But uh, in some, uh, actually in sparse data set, this result is uh, like variance uh, is uh, getting high because uh, for example, if we divide a very small, like a small amount of uh, number, then a loss function value will be very like high and uh, and uh, and vice versa. So uh, even though this uh, the like loss function introduced by Saito uh, is uh, like theoretically proven, this is a uh, like unbiased estimator, but uh, variance might be getting higher. So, but uh, he, in his latest paper, he like uh, addressing this challenge by introducing a double robust estimator so that he. We still have a unbiased estimator for while, right? Uh, like reducing a variance. So I found uh, this approach might be interesting. So 
uh, I'm reading this paper and I'm uh, <laughs> testing the discoder as well. And uh, <clears throat> if I understand correctly, this paper uh, like trying the uh, point uh, point pointwise loss function, but uh, if we could uh, maybe what we could try to like expand this research a bit, like uh, try to compare another type of loss function, such as not only pointwise, uh, but also implement a pairwise and a listwise uh, loss function to see if the uh, but like a uh, pre uh, pressure recall or TCG can be uh, Im improved. And uh, yeah, so and uh, yeah, so this is a one way for this such direction. And uh, I also explore a way to apply this kind of uh, propensity scope based approach for such systems, but. Uh, uh, I, uh, I found that it's hard to like find a better data set to apply this research because in this research, uh, data set requirement is uh, training data should be kind of a uh, biased. Uh, ideally, training data is how say, kind of a, uh, we can sim simulate, simulate the behavior of implicit back, feedback, which is biased. And the testing data sh ideally should be kind of a, uh, unbiased uh, in order to simulate a real time uh, like real, real world application. But uh, as far as I checked, the, I think uh, Yahoo Music and the Quoto dataset only satisfy this requirement. And these data set, uh, like both of them are kind of a recommendation data set. So I think uh, we should focus on more recommendation system application. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, roughly speaking, that's the, the thing we are trying to, and yeah, we still, yeah, yeah, so we still do some like exploration on that, like a preliminary experimentation phase. Yeah, yeah uh, so uh, that's all for mine. So, Adit, could you also, yeah. Uh, update um, yeah. yeah yeah so i don't have much update unfortunately for myself but um what i what i did was i uh, managed to download the yahoo data set and i was uh, testing it out with that uh, data set uh, there's some error with the uh, a small issue with the original code and i sent a pull request for that um and uh, apart from that, it was, um, yeah, I, ma I managed to get some data out, but um, is with, with this, uh, sorry, the repository I was testing on is the first one, the unbiased pairwise rec, which I created a fork for and, and then uh, tested it out. So um, I, I did get some data, but like I haven't really uh, fully like, I, like understood like the code base as yet. So I'm I'm still working with that. I, I think for the other one, unbiased offline recommender evaluation, um, uh, Taka was using the code data set to work with it, right? Ah uh, yes, yeah. Since I don't have access to Yahoo data set, so I yeah yeah I, yeah, I, I, work I, on this, I yeah. mean I can just pass you the the okay yeah, but there, there's some terms and conditions right okay. yeah maybe um, I, yeah i should just provide a my code so that you can also experiment in the yahoo data set yeah in order okay, to okay. Comp comply yeah. with some other condition yeah. yeah so i i can test for the other code base as well so, yeah but i haven't really um, carried out the training here so this um, training and testing time is uh, yeah, yet to be like checked yeah, from from my side, that's all. The yeah, I, I don't have any other updates. Okay. Uh, do you want to go over the rest of your slides, uh, or, or you don't have anything there? Mm -hmm. I. Yes. Uh, yeah. Then not so much, okay. yeah, in that thing, yeah. That's fine. 
So uh, let's thank first uh, Taka and Adit for presenting. So uh, if you have comments, uh, please put them in the chat. I think uh, here it's uh, very critical to make sure, just like uh, the first team said, that there's good uh, team communication. Uh, um, it's, of course, much more challenging when you have uh, different uh, people from different backgrounds participating. So Adit, I think, is an undergraduate and Taka is an a industry veteran uh, who's been through 6101, I think, three different times, always um, uh, giving uh, great projects. So I think the important thing here is that uh, it's good to try to control how much variability is going into your projects because if data sets are an issue um, and uh, you want to work with different data sets is great, but maybe uh, in the interest of time and, and the amount of work that uh, you have to put in, uh, it's good to proceed to you know, the model uh, variations, right? Because you wanted to uh, try the different loss functions and test the code. And if things are not converging, uh, you wanna cut your losses and just use the one or two data sets that you're able to use. Yeah, so it's great that Adit, uh, because he's within uh, our academic community, has access to the uh, Yahoo data set. So um, hopefully um, the two of you are negotiating and making sure that Adit has sufficient amount of time reserved for the project, okay? So for our DYOM students, uh, remember you guys have to do 140 hours for the, the course in order to qualify for the four MCs. And that does mean that uh, your, your actual project work should consume somewhere between uh, 60 to 80 hours, okay? Uh, no less than that. For our, our uh, under, uh, for our graduate students and our external participants, we expect much less. So uh, in this case, since Adit is an undergraduate, if I'm correct, um, then it means that uh, you have to pull a, a larger part of the weight on the project, okay? So um, that, that's also a very big consideration going into the second half of the term. Uh, which we're all now in. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that later. Okay, so I keep at it, uh, especially um, you do need to uh, have um, a clear expectation uh, about what you expect to be able to deliver in the project. Okay, so those slides eight and nine where uh, we traditionally put a schedule, uh, please do fill that out uh, and then you know calibrate against how, how well you're doing. Okay, great. So uh, we'll go on to our next uh, project group. Uh, so uh, you guys can stop your screen share and uh, we'll have uh, Peng Tai's groups, group seven on DeepFM uh, present. Okay, hi, just let me share my screen. All right, um, can, can you guys see my yeah. screen? Okay, yeah, uh, unfortunately, um, the other two teammates cannot make it today. I think Asriari is having a midterm right now, so I'll just cover for both of them. Um, so yeah, uh, so first off, a recap on the motivation and the project overall. Um, we are doing a recommendation system project, and um, basically what we are trying to do is to um, try to first replicate the results that the DPFM model, that the paper has um, produced, which we actually shared last week uh, as well. Um, and also uh, because the paper itself suggests the ways of potential improvement. So we also would like to try it out, see whether we can actually try to make it better. So yeah, so this is the key paper and um, the link is here. And also the, the entire projects on deck, the slide deck is on in, in on Slack. So if you guys would like to see, just can just click the link. And, and here is, we've also set up a code base. So it's here. And in terms of the evaluation metric, uh, we used uh, the CMS to paper, AUC and lock loss. We also, I think at the start to get a, an idea in terms of the classification, we also, introduced um, confusion metrics here. Um, last time we only had a very small sample data set about like 200 um, entries, which um, was like, I think it's too late though. And we managed to find a larger data set uh, with about 80K entries, but this is still very small. 
compared to the actual criteria data set. Um, we tried to train with this larger data set we found, um, but the issue which I'll elaborate uh, later is um, it does seem to converge for the training set, um, but um, the, the loss is actually increasing when we apply it to the STM data set. So we did something like this. Um, if you, uh, um, I'm not entirely familiar with this because that's what Asherf did, but um, based on what he told me, uh, he tried to use both just FM without the deep component as well because the data is small. And we also tried to use the original deep FM. Like they, they both actually um, have a decrease in loss when we train them, but both of them have, um, sorry, the, the validation, not the test. Um, the loss is actually increasing. So we are a bit puzzled by this. Um, and we, one thing we tried, um, yeah, it's yeah. I mean, I mean, it looks like a case of overfitting, and we were wondering um, whether it's because the model capacity is too large and our data set is too small. Um, one thing that um, Asharu went on to try is to and um, try to remove. He, he realized that there's a lot of uh, missing values. Um, like uh, within the um, data set itself. So he removes those rows with um, more than 90% uh, missing values. And we managed to get a better result for that. Um, yeah, so that, that helped, but we, uh, we think it, we should still um, um, to, because we want to replicate on the paper, so we still need to try to find a way to actually find the overall data set. Um, one thing I did here, because when I looked into the code he shared with me, um, there's actually a different repos are released by the same author. One used PyTorch and this one used TensorFlow. And I realized um, he changed the hidden units from the default um, 256 by 256 to just 20 by 20. I think maybe he's considering almost that um, the, like the data set is actually small, but I just went down to just keep, um, stick to the original default. And we, we do see that um, I, I get actually the same results as him if I don't do any data preprocessing. So I guess the key issue here is we need to find um, the entire creative data set we did manage, I think um, Prof Ming also pointed out, point this to us last time and went to try to download. But the, the current hurdle that we are um, facing is that, like, in, first of course, it's, it's very huge, but um, it, like, after I downloaded 17% of the entire data set, um, I got this error from the, I think, from probably from the remote server. So, uh, we are still trying to see how we can, yeah, how we can solve this um, problem. Uh, we would also uh, uh, love to hear that if uh, there's some suggestion for us in terms later, um, 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 in terms of how we can possibly um, deal with this issue we are currently facing. Um, <laughs> sorry, I actually I don't. Well, the same was high level. Um, yeah, maybe Professor GG. Well, you may want to look at places where bit. your um, your curl or your download process is not timing out because if it's something that's being run on a terminal, um, in some cases, but it looks like you're using your own MacBook to download, right? Not a mm -hmm. server, um, mm -hmm. then you will have timeouts. But I guess it's not a, a case for your own client computer. Yeah. You may want to uh, ask other people on the on the web, uh, sorry, on the group to try to download it. Uh, if you use um, a computer that has a wired Ethernet, like a server, um, in any of our research clusters, uh, it will be a lot faster. I think uh, I think that's one of the big problems that you have here is that your server, um, you know, you're doing it through a wireless transfer, so the 
the download mm-hmm. speed is really, really pathetic. It's like a half a meg a second, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, yeah. all right, all right. I, I'll ask um, the other um, group mates to also try this, um, hopefully on the server if we have that text. And yeah, so um, for the development for us is to try to get the entire data set and also try to um, improve um, the original model. Mm. And here is to schedule. Um, and I think what um, we need to do is also really try to have more regular meetups, even if it's virtual. Um, and also, yeah, so for the questions, but I guess, um, yeah, we, we, we would love to have some advice on both of these issues. The first one is about um, the data set. But, uh, um, yeah, I guess, for the start, I can try to uh, ask other group members to uh, try to download it. And for the second one is, yeah, if anyone has further impro- uh, suggestions in terms of uh, extensions to the DeepFM model, we would also love to hear your know, advice. Yeah, I, I think that's all that we have to share for today. So any comments from other people? Yeah, I think you, you may not need the whole data set because the whole data set is so big, it may be impossible for you to train anyways. So if there's any way that they have sliced the data set to make a smaller batch, then you can try to download anything larger than the set that you have now. Okay, I mean, uh, ideally you can double your data set size and then you can still realistically do um, the type of uh, project uh, training. Okay, you want to get to a point where you have enough data um, so that you can reasonably make progress in one sprint, right? If your data set is too large, for example, one terabyte, one uh, round of training may take you longer than a week, right? So then uh, a sprint is going to take, you know, several months just to, to get the training done. So um, it's good that you have a small amount of data, but even if you download the heart, the big uh, one, uh, it may be something that you need. So Yisong, I guess, uh, also noted something. Yisong, do you want to say something? You know, uh, did I try to uh, download it online? It is still still slow. I, I'm downloading from a wired machine, and it's uh, uh, it's very slow. the The time estimated is two and more hours. Yeah. Yeah, but it's better than Peng Tai's. I think it was eight hours or something like that. So, uh, I mean, that's a four times speed up. And uh, from your screenshot, it seems to be at least three times faster. But you know, these things change over time. So uh, Joe also uh, has something to, to add, I think, but uh, okay, it's the slides for the next group. Yeah, I, I think possible ways to improve the DFFF model will come after you get some uh, ideas on the, um, you know, from the data. And uh, again, you can do a little bit of forward chaining, meaning uh, look at paper, papers that cite uh, this paper mm-hmm. and um, try to be inspired by them. I think one of the easiest ways to get inspired for a project of this size, because it's um, not a lot of time, is to uh, you know try to replicate things on a new data set, or try to take another uh, approach that's downstream from this one, meaning that cites this work and improves upon it, and try to impose it on the same data set. Okay, so you, you can just do a little bit of incremental process. The whole point of the project is not necessarily to create new knowledge, is to to enhance your own um, technical savvy. Uh, with those models so that you can feel uh, competent and um, have some experience working with them. And hopefully that can inform your own um, you know, experience as either a PhD student or uh, advanced undergraduate um, looking for jobs or internships later. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, actually we, um, we, we, we saw a paper on X deep FM. Yeah, I, I think that's one possible way we can extend the model. Yeah. So, uh, you know, very small things can can already count. So like changing the loss function a little bit, changing the way uh, you do your convergence, uh, experimenting with different uh, sizes uh, of data or, uh, you know, anything of this sort of hyperparameters 
um, are also okay. I mean, generally, I don't like hyperparameter tuning because it's sort of meaningless, but uh, sometimes you can get good um, insights from, from that and see how stable the models are. Okay, so um, all of those are fine. Uh, so uh, uh, we look forward to your, your next sprint update uh, since you have a calendar of uh, what you're going to do uh, on one of your slides. I forget which slide it's on. Um, let's see, let's go to slide 15. Yeah, um, then uh, you're getting towards the deep uh, replic uh, replication, which is good. Um, but you also have to take into account the fact that uh, uh, now uh, it's getting towards the end of the semester and then uh, weeks nine through 12 will be pretty busy for everyone. So uh, just make sure that you have um, reserved a good uh, chunk of time between the three of you to, to work on the project together. You know. Like um, the first group said, it's good to try to schedule sometimes that are synchronous for everyone to uh, work together and hit bugs and try to resolve them together. So it looks like you're doing that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, uh, Peng Tai, for presenting on behalf of Asaru and Shunlan. Okay, so uh, yeah. I think we have our next Thank team. You. So Guan Hao also says uh, something about the data loader. Yeah. So uh, I think that's meant for uh, this, this team, right? Yes. All right. So I think it will be the next team. So uh, Prof, can I just ask, uh, due to interest of time, uh, do we just go through the updates? Is yeah. it? Okay, sure. All right. Hi everyone, we are IGMC. So yeah, just a recap. Our project is uh, to is for is inductive matrix completion. Lah. So inductive in this sense means that you can generalize to answer slash items that are not in the training set. And also you can transfer learn. So the project abstract is to extend this IGMC uh, model by proposing extensions. So a few extensions which we feel are independent. So we have adaptive depth, which is really to control the information attained from each uh, RGCN layer, so each of the message passing layer. Um, graph norm is to improve training convergence, something along the lines of like batch norm, instance norm. And the other one would be to change the core GNN architecture that is being used currently from RGCN to another one called graph stage, uh, as well as other stuff. Um, so here are the project details. Um, we cut down our data set so we don't need to. Basically, we are now focusing on just fixer and VLANs for the K because they are uh, relatively smaller. And later on, if we have the time, uh, maybe around week 11, we will try to apply both the base model or first our extensions on a new data set that was not uh, evaluated in the original paper. So, uh, due to each time, we won't be able to go through the, like, the ideas of the paper. But uh, do feel free to go through for reference. The, the whole idea is very simple. Uh. It's just you get a very, very big graph, the original big uh, matrix. Then you just extract a local, very small local graph for each user item that you're interested in. And then you uh, perform a graph level prediction. So that is the general idea of the paper. So here is our overall progress. Oops, sorry. Um, previously, we actually mentioned about maybe using a attention mechanism to update the node features in the in our network, uh, the graph network. But the idea actually doesn't work straight away, like natively, because the there are actually the different H types. Uh, in this case, it represents the different ratings. So one to five. So, so each rating will, will correspond to a different H. So uh, unfortunately, the GAT doesn't have this information, meaning it treats the H of a rating one is the same as a rating five. So that's obviously not good. So now, uh, basically, Stephen is trying out uh, basically an RGAT idea. So it's using the same idea of the R part of the RGCN, but applying it to the GAT. Yep. And aside from that, we've also explored the other ideas, which I mentioned before. And something that's in progress, uh, I think we are, we are pretty much done with this. We uh, just haven't plotted it, plotted it out yet. It's the We just made some alterations to the original visualizations. So now they, we are focusing on showing some of the worst performing um, subgraphs in the test set. So basically, this is the way we can maybe, I mean, this is the hope, is that we can see visually the patterns from the graphs, and then we can see like, why are they bad? But uh, of course, it might not be so easy. Like, maybe it looks very random or what. But yeah, this is the hope that there's some patterns that we can visually see. Then, oops, let me move this away. Um, 
yeah, so another idea is basically to subset a bad case test set from the movie lens 100k. So right now the test set I believe has 2k or uh, 20k reviews, uh, 20%. So maybe we, we take like maybe the 500 worst performing based on RMSC, uh, based on the current model, and then we keep that aside and we evaluate on that if the extensions can help to improve on these bad case, bad cases. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the main extensions ideas that we've had is a uh, LSTM attention uh, aggregation idea on the four message passing layers. So yeah, this is the adaptive def idea. So the reason why it's adaptive def is because basically uh, this, this mechanism is used to uh, put different weights on each of the layers outputs. Right? Because in the finale, we basically concatenate all the layer output together. Uh, all the node feature representations of each of the layer output. So in this, in our case, we're using four layers. So yeah. So basically we concatenate four different vectors together. So we want to put weights on how how much, how, how important are these things are. Yeah. So um uh, so yeah, the concatenation obviously just is the one that's just used by the paper. So this one is basically we're just adding weights uh, to and then we found that actually the weights are fairly similar. So maybe this idea uh not really doing that much. But uh yeah. So maybe I just go to the next slide straight. So as you can see from the performances, it's almost identical. And the the issue right now is that uh, the LSTM attention is actually increasing the, the training time by a lot. So what this means is that actually we are pretty much over parameterizing using this LSTM attention part. So maybe there's too many parameters in this section. So definitely we don't want this part to overwhelm the base model because at the end of the day, we are still using the outputs from each of the base models layers. So yeah, definitely we don't want this to be like the important part of the model uh, is yeah then it, it completely defeats the purpose uh. yep so we'll make changes to to reduce the number of parameters here uh, make it smaller and stuff and uh, I, I guess that you can keep in mind this uh, table because uh, it shows the the base value so in particular i guess the epoch 40 values yep um, and your training time looks pretty reasonable so that's good uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that that's working out. Um, oh yeah, so we are using this the very small data set which is fixed. Uh, mm -hmm. So later on, once uh, we've done, we've we've checked that you know things are working, then only we apply it to like the Amazon one as well as the Movie Lens hundred K one, which are bigger. Yeah, but of yeah, course, I mean, uh, yeah. you want, may want to try to subsample the items because I mean a hundred K items is still a lot. Um, so uh, because you're really looking at just local neighborhood. So you need to, um, the local part of the graph to be fairly dense, but the rest of the, the you know, the, the user item matrix probably doesn't make a lot of um, impact. Okay. I guess the, the main motivation for the original IGMC paper was that uh, even in a like a less dense, in fact, it, it performs even better in a less dense situation relative to like the other state of the art. Uh. But I guess because now we are comparing against that base paper, so it doesn't, it's not so important for us to, to do that comparison. Uh. So yeah, we will consider doing subsampling on the user items. Yeah, that's dense, exactly uh. right. You want to uh, try to make the um, setting of the semester, uh, meaning that you only have about four weeks or so left, um, before needing to finish up, you want to make that work in your favor. So uh, yeah, you don't have to pursue the original motivations for the paper in looking at uh, less dense data. So yeah, the other idea is graph stage. So uh, basically the idea of graph stage is instead of sampling everyone from the neighborhood, uh, like how at GCN, so GCN, you update everybody from, the, from the, your neighbors, right? For each layer, so in graph stage, we, we actually do some sort of like sampling first, and then only we, we do the aggregation and stuff. So uh, similar to GCM, but it's a bit like having some extra subsampling. Ah, my Oh, am I muted? Oh, sorry. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> the wrong person by accident. My, <laughs> yeah, my bad. Right. Yeah. yeah. So this is actually really is about to improve the efficiency, and possibly allow us to use two hop networks, uh, neighbor neighboring uh, subgraphs instead of just one hop, which is the one that's being used right now. Uh, so because we are using the I'm 
at the moment we've compared it is to the one hot base RGCN results. So actually there's almost no differences also because I think the value of this idea only is only for like bigger graph. Uh, so maybe it's not a fair comparison yet. Uh, but yeah, if if the two hop doesn't take too much time, we will go and do that comparison also. And the other benefit is that graph stage can be transductive. And I know that the original paper, the whole idea of the paper is to be inductive, but I guess graph stage has this additional flexibility in that if we want to make it transductive, it can be transductive. But I don't think we will be exploring this. Yeah, just uh, just to just additional notes. Uh. Yeah, and, you don't want to yeah. focus on you know any type of sampling uh, strategy for that. So you don't have to take graph stages as uh, sampling strategy as well. You know, if you you think the one hop neighborhood, uh, you know, you could subsample that and just see how much worse it gets by subsampling even one hop neighbors. That might be mm -hmm. a, a good way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can just take the strategy, not the network. Right? Mm. Then. Lastly, would be the graph norm one that I would like to highlight today is uh, the idea is, is really just to speed up the training convergence. And yeah, so uh, it's, the idea is actually very similar to instance norm, where uh, an instance norm is also similar to batch norm. So maybe batch norm is the one that people are familiar with. So in batch norm, you actually subtract each batch by the batch mean and stuff like that. Um, instead of that, for instance norm, we basically subtract each individual uh, item. Um, in this case, it's the graph. La. Yeah, so we minus the graph mean. So the addition that graph norm introduces over instance norm is just one additional parameter, which controls how much of the mean do you subtract. So that means you just introduce like an alpha. So if alpha is one, then it's just basically the normal instance norm. So yeah, you're just introducing a new parameter to control how much to subtract because they argue that certain graphs uh, is better not to, it, it actually may be removing some information if you minus the mean. La. So yeah, so that's the only difference for graph norm. And performance is like slightly better. So unfortunately, I can't give accurate time because uh, I actually, like we all trade this on like different uh, hardware. So so time, the kind of comparison for this particular one is not accurate. So we, we are going to have to try on on to see whether time considerations is, it makes sense or so. But just very, very, very minimal, slightly better performance. Uh, but yeah, other than that, uh, nothing significant, I think. Okay, and, so yeah. I understand that you guys are all doing different things, right? Yeah. So, okay, that, that makes sense. Uh, now we are, at this stage, we are basically going to combine everything with you. So uh, maybe I can just look straight to the schedule. La. Yeah, so our, our, this week we are supposed to combine everything already and then uh, start doing all the analysis. For example, the one where we get the best, the bad case test set, as well as looking at the visualizations for the worst performing uh, graph, things like that. Yeah. So I guess here are the, did I miss anything? Yeah, no, yeah. So just the questions for others. Uh, so I guess considering the performance for each of our individual extensions, it really doesn't seem to be changing much. Uh, even if a bit also, like, it's just very, very, very minimal. So I, I, I guess we are probably a, a bit late to be looking for other extensions, right? I think in general, you've done enough extensions. So each of you is looking at separate dif different extensions, right? Mm -hmm. Some of you are looking at, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, making the convergence and the calculations faster, which may not influence the results too much. And then uh, for the sampling and, and other parts, they, they will change your performance a bit. So uh, you may want to decide, uh, you know, which one is the most uh, interesting one that you guys want to focus on and, and pursue that together. Or if you think that there are reasonably interesting experiments for each part, then you can uh, do those all separately and continue to vest down your individual paths uh, to make a unified project. It's perfectly fine either way. Okay. Yeah. And I guess maybe not enough time for this, but one, one idea that we had really was to sort of, based on our visualizations or based on our bad cases, right? We want to see if there's possibly a way to sort of extract information. So I, I don't really know. Uh, like for this one, we, we, we just had a thought like maybe like we can extract some sort of like, like I mean, I don't think it's, it's feasible in the amount of time we have left, but yeah, just a thought was be, would be to extract some sort of engineer features. But I, I mean, I think it completely defeats the point of having a, a graph neural network, but yeah, something that we can extract from the bad cases. Because right now, I feel that when we get the bad cases, the, all the subgraphs, um, we just don't know like what information can, can we even get from that, you know? So yeah, we're not sure if there's a, maybe a way to extract some, some information that tells us something like, I don't know, maybe 
for some reason, having a lot of uh, value to sort of make the model perform very bad. Something along those lines, no idea, but yeah. Yeah, so when you look at the bad cases and you look at the subgraphs, you're looking for some type of differential analysis, right? So when it's a good graph, what type of demographics does it have in terms of neighbors, uh, distance, you know, centrality, et cetera, other types of measures? you know, compared to uh, the, 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 the case of, of the bad ones, right? And then uh, if, if you have some clustering analysis, like are all the uh, bad graphs somehow uh, uh, homogeneous or are they heterogeneous, right? Uh, are, are there different clusters of, of things that are considered good or bad? So that type of analysis actually takes a lot of time. It may take some time to visualize and, and then make some sense out of that because looking at raw numbers really gives you a very good intuition for what's going on. Um, so yeah, you may want to try to actually walk through one or two uh, in a micro uh, example. So like know what uh, items they represent, know, know what neighbors are being represented there and then try to formulate a, a reason why. And then use those micro cases to engineer a good, uh, what we call mm. meso cases. Yeah, where there's groups of items that conform to the same type of demographics. Okay, it looks very good. Thank you, yeah. uh, Joe, for presenting on behalf of your group. All right. Yeah, that's all we have. I okay, thanks. Okay, now we have group five. So uh, do we have anyone from group five? We have two more groups. And then uh, I think we're going to finish, it looks like around uh, 2.40 or so. And then uh, we'll, we'll talk with the uh, last set of uh, folks uh, before we finish up today. Yep. So. Uh... Uh, I'm from group five and we are going to present. Okay, great. Share your screen when you're ready, uh, Kwok. So uh, our group works on uh, neural collaborative filtering. So, uh, to re reiterate our motivation for the project, we hope to replicate the uh, results obtained from the original paper as well as uh, evaluating different uh, metrics for our recommendation system and to extend the model architecture and training process where possible. Yeah, so this is our original paper from uh, Siangna. And uh, just to a brief go through of uh, our model. So our model is an ensemble of uh, generalized matrix factorization and a multi-layer perceptron. So, uh, the, mo the model will be a neural matrix factorization model because of this ensemble. And we, we, um, the model uh, try to fuse these two uh, separate uh, model, uh, separate component models uh, to combine both the linearity of uh, generalized matrix factorization as well as the non-linearity of uh, multi-layer perception to best capture the user item interaction. So, uh, so far our features and work, we have been able to replicate uh, the model and the result presented in the paper. Uh, we have two uh, working implement, uh, we have two uh, implementations to, to uh, replicate after. One is the author's implementation and the other one is from a Microsoft GitHub repo. And we have experimented with uh, both doing a uh, pre-trained uh, component models before combining them into uh, neural MF, and we have compared with uh, non pre trained neural MF. And we are also experimenting with uh, uh, using a different uh, loss function uh, yeah, to compare it with uh, to see whether we can change the model uh, training process. Yeah, so. Um, so far, uh, the way we evaluate our code is that uh, the author have also mentioned the results when he's trained uh, with other baseline models, such as item KNN. So uh, by running, we have been able to run there and get the same uh, results from the author uh, implementation. Yeah, so uh, basically that's what we have done so far. And we are also uh, ev trying to evaluate it on the, uh, the, the same metrics, uh, 
which will, will form our basis for extension later on uh, on uh, different other metrics. Um, in terms of target, we are slightly behind due to midterm, but uh, we are comp uh, compensating the delay in this sprint for the next sprint. So our current, this is our current code base uh, on GitHub. And we are also referencing uh, uh, a number of metrics from uh, Microsoft uh, GitHub. Uh, they mentioned that they, uh, they have the use of uh, rating and ranking matrix. So we are referencing it. And our data set is the 100,000 movie lens data set. And for our training, we are getting, uh, uh, yeah, we can, our training is con uh, it converges and it takes about 150 seconds per epoch for 20 epoch, but the result uh, converges at around 10 epoch. Yeah, so next up, I will uh, pass on to uh, a team member to talk about our experiment. Yeah, so um, in general, our team has like two possible extensions we want to explore. So the first one, uh, me and Sasha, uh, we are going to work on it. And the first one is actually uh, changing a loss function, uh, modifying a loss function. So um, actually in a paper, they use a point-wise point loss function. So if you see in this image, actually it's predicting the, the score based on a single um, user and a single item interaction. So um, one, so this uh, loss function is actually quite commonly used, but another very commonly used one is actually the pairwise loss function, which was actually suggested by paper, but was not implemented uh, by the paper as well. So um, next slide. Yeah, so what a pairwise loss function actually does is that it'll choose um, two items. So let's say both items have the same labels in the sense that the user has interacted with both items or the user has not interacted with both items then um, the loss function will be zero when both items have very similar representations. So like, let's say the Euclidean distance of um, the representations of two items that has been visited by the user is very close, then the loss function will be zero. Whereas let's say um, there's an item that the user has visited and there's an item that the user has not visited. So um, the loss function will try to maximize the distance between uh, these two items. So that's what uh, roughly what the pairwise loss function does. So um, next slide, please. So what we'd like to investigate is like um, how the training on convergence uh, will change and how like the results on the different metrics will change if we like convert the point-wise loss function uh, to pairwise loss function in our experimentation. And uh, what other like tendencies do we notice in the uh, process? So I think that will become as further analysis after we uh, actually modify the code. So I think um, one thing that we've been trying to do is actually uh, changing the pre-processing steps of the data, because that's something you do if you want to adopt the pairwise loss function. And then after that, we'll uh, modify the training. So I think this, uh, this is still in progress for us, and um, we'll probably expect results analysis next week, by next week. Yeah. I think um, that's all for our first extension. Uh, the second extension, uh, Clarence will come up. Yep. So thanks, Gabriel. So the second extension, okay. we're actually trying to uh, change the way we are evaluating our model. So currently uh, for the paper, we are, they are using this heat, heat ratio evaluation where uh, they are seeing if the, if the latest entry of the item, item user interaction actually appears in the top 10 uh, recommended, recommended uh, items that they, for the user. So uh, looking at that particular matrix, we feel that, they are actually, that it may not be a very representative way of uh, evaluating our model. So some of the matrix that we're actually looking to uh, can be broken down into actually two different components. Uh, one is the rating matrix and the other is the ranking matrix. So rating matrix is basically, uh, for example, using the RMSC, the R square, and explaining how much of the variance is explained by the model. Uh, where something similar to the heat ratio is something like the ranking matrix, where we are more focused on uh, things like precision, we call, and also uh, the normalized discount community gain. Yeah, so uh, next slide. Yeah, so uh, this is the three different uh, developments that we'll be looking to uh, enhance upon uh, in the, in the, at least in week nine and week 10. So for the first de development, we will hope to be able to validate the evaluate matrix on the degrees of representativeness. Uh, so as explained previously, we are hoping to see if there are other, other evaluation, evaluation matrix that will be more suited to the model that we are actually uh, going for, especially since we are planning to move towards a 
pairwise loss function now and see if it actually affects the evaluation matrix in the process as well. The next one will be to uh, try to pivot away from the moving lens data set that we are currently working on to something uh, to the Amazon one instead and to see if, for example, the model representation that we have uh, created can be able to generalize to other user item interactions uh, in other data sets. So that's something that we're hoping to uh, see if it actually works as well. And because we want a model that's not only able to generalize to a particular uh, situation, but to be able to do it for different kinds of user item interaction as well. And finally, for the third development, as mentioned by Gabriel previously, uh, we'll be hoping to update this loss function that we are that the paper is currently using to the pairwise loss. And uh, I think currently we have uh, Sasha has been has created some uh, implementations on this pairwise loss function now, and uh, we'll be releasing. We'll be hoping to release some of these uh, results in the next sprint. Yeah. So. Uh, I think that's the end for our share. Yeah, so this is just basically the timeline that we have for uh, the next three weeks at least. Yeah, so if any questions, yeah, you can let us know. Yeah, so uh, again, when you do pairwise loss, it's good for certain types of things where there's a preference, but not an actual ground truth. So uh, it makes sense for recommendation to use pairwise loss in a lot of times, and I think uh, Taka and Adit's group uh, also alluded to this type of thing. So you may want to um, keep tabs on their project as well. Um, so I think these are all good things to think about. Um, like I wrote in the in the uh, threads, you can think about uh, extensions on, on the sampling and uh, what types of things that you want to see from uh, your hypothesized uh, developments from uh, experiment two. Okay, let's thank um, uh, Clarence, uh, Gabriel, and uh, Falk for their presentation. Great job, guys. Okay, uh, we'll move on to the next group. Uh, I think that's uh, Yi Song's group. Um, there are two okay. of them. Yeah. Yeah, I have unmuted. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, yeah, can you guys see my screen? Yes, I can, I think, because yes. I have multiple devices. So, hi everyone, I'm Yi Song and my teammate is Chang Xin. Uh, we are both uh, uh, the newly coming uh, PhD student. Uh, my research interest is NLP and her research interest is in spatial temporal uh, data modeling. Yeah, so uh, the title of our project is called uh, Causal Estimation. So here's some recap. Uh, the type of our project is in CRS, Conversational Recommendation System. And you know, to, if we uh, take a one sentence summary of our uh, research is that uh, we try to mitigate a popularity bias in CRS with causal embedding. And here are some key resources. So uh, the project's called causal estimation. So, so, so first we have a causal paper um, and this paper is uh, introduced by me, myself, and, uh, and, and, and Gabriel in week six. So uh, do you guys still remember this paper, right? Yeah, great, yeah. So uh, the second paper uh, is basically my master thesis. It's on conversational recommendation on a multi-round scenario. So, you know, we are going to combine this paper together and do a, uh, a combination work. So, you know, uh, our overall progress, we haven't uh, get our hands dirty. Yeah, we haven't started uh, engineering. You know, a disclaimer is that, you know, we too are registered for the second half. Yeah, So we haven't started our engineering. Yeah, and uh, because we, we are focusing on our uh, core uh, research other than this uh, lab rotation. And yeah, but we still managed to get some progress in, in the ideation and, and communication with the author of the DICE paper. Yeah, so, you know, uh, I'm very happy that, you know, the, the, uh, the author of DICE paper, uh, Mr. Uh, Yu Zheng uh, from Tsinghua University, a year two PhD student, he really liked my feedback. Yeah, you know, he liked our idea on generalizing the DICE framework into a full factorization machine model. So, you know, in week six, we have uh, introduced that the DICE model only, mo only deal with, you know, the user and item embeddings, and they, they have, uh, mm, uh, they forgo 
modeling uh, the the very uh, useful features, right? And I have asked him, is it possible to do so, so that we can also try to mitigate attribute bias? And he said it's quite interesting and good, but but you know, but uh, he he raises concern that how can we appropriately design cause specific data for features uh, for features and attributes yeah so we are sort of stuck at this point and we haven't started our engineering so we have uh, you know uh, uh, updated our hypothesis you know the uh, CRS system has popular bias in attribute and second, hypothesis is that CRS has popular bias in, in items. So, you know, for, to, uh, to address the first bias, we generalize the DICE model to full FM to mitigate bias in attribute. And to address the second uh, bias, we directly adopt bias to mitigate the bias in items. And here are some core examples, right? So uh, basically, and these are the case study I have done before before. So uh, as we can see, uh, this is a multi-run conversational recommendation session where, you know, the user with the ID 21243, uh, he has a, a target item with ID of 25168 in the Yelp data set. Yelp is a, a restaurant res reservation uh, domain. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, our our model named year has failed this session. And the reason is that Here's one key attribute called event planning and services. And this attribute uh, uh, has not been asked by year, meaning that year has difficulty asking this attribute. And the reason is that uh, this attribute is a very low frequency one, meaning that this attribute is not uh, popular. And, and you know, when, when training the reinforcement learning, uh, the, you know, the, the model uh, has not learned to ask this attribute given the reward it has received, right? So I think uh, uh, our hypothesis is that by using some causal embedding, we can mitigate the bias that such low frequency or unpopular attribute could get got a higher chance to be asked, right? So, so, so on this page is our intuition to, to mitigate the attribute bias. And our approach is that we, 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 we generalize the dice model into a full FM model. And luckily in the year framework, our model is also based on FM. Yeah. So it's our hypothesis and we don't know, we don't know if it's going to work. <laughs> and, and, and here is this our um, uh, second toy, a toy example on the item bias, right? So, you know, unfortunately the, the, the model also failed on this uh, session and the, and, and our hypothesis is that, you know, uh, um, the, the item is associated with very few uh, attributes and maybe this item is not quite popular and, and the, the recommender tends to, to, to make uh, a popular item as their recommendation. So you know that there are also some uh, baselines in the uh, recommended, uh, in, in the Rexis community, some, some baselines called the popularity baselines, right? So uh, I'm uh, uh, suspecting that maybe our offline trained recommender model tends to frequently recommend those popular items, right? So here's also the bias in the items. So, you know, again, uh, uh, we are going to, uh, to, so here's our high uh, 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 with our key hypothesis, you know, the first is the attribute bias and second is the item bias. And we are going to, uh, uh, to generalize the dice to, to, to be adapted to our uh, multi-round CRS task. So we, we plan to do our engineering starting this week. Yeah, so, uh, so firstly, uh, we are investigating bias, right? So we first need to locate the bias and to analyze it. So in week eight, this week, we are going 
to do some evaluation on bias, we're going to find a matrix to, to describe the, the bias. And we, we, ha we haven't found it yet. Yeah, so we, we need a matrix for the bias. And on the week nine, we're going to generalize the factorization machine model. Uh, uh, sorry, we're going to generalize the dice model into a full factorization machine. Yeah, so it's our plan. Yeah. Yeah, that's me. Proof me any yeah, feedback? Yeah. yeah, I put some feedback in your, your thread. Um, uh, if anyone else has any feedback, uh, uh, please add to the thread. In the interest of time, I think uh, we'll, we'll go ahead so that we can complete close to free flop. Okay, so let's thank Yi Song and uh, his teammate for uh, the presentation. So we have our uh, last team now. So that is our, um, see, um, uh, no, that is the last team. That's causal estimation. Okay, so um, we will have uh, our week nine group uh, preparing the slides for lecture. Uh, so um, those of you uh, involved in uh, DYOM, um, uh, get ready for that if you're assigned that project group. Um, those of you who have already presented from uh, groups one through six, uh, you're welcome to go. I, I will uh, stay on to talk with the 6101 uh, students uh, that are starting in the second lab rotation, um, excluding Yi Song's group because they, they actually have been starting from the, the first half. Okay, so um, for the rest of you, thanks for joining us. We'll see you uh, next week on Friday uh, again for the class. Okay, thank you. So um, those of you with us for the uh, new lab rotation, I'm just gonna go through uh, some ground rules with you. So uh, just pardon me while I get set up. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Let's see. Okay, so um, First of all, welcome to this lab rotation. I hope uh, you have a, a good time ahead of you. Uh, I know it's getting uh, busier and busier, so it's a, a lot more work, um, but it's important that, that uh, I think like the first group said, uh, Yu Shi and, and uh, 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 Shi Chen and uh, Tenzin said, uh, it's important to really get your hands dirty. I mean, the whole point is that if you're studying different areas of computer science uh, or information systems, you benefit a lot from having uh, uh, exposure to state-of-the-art research in a tangential area. Okay, so maybe you're just uh, interested in NLP and, and IR, and then this is your, your chance to get exposed to that. Okay, so uh, in particular, uh, I wanna go through this slide deck, uh, which some of you may have uh, seen already um, for uh, our 6101. So in particular, uh, this is a, not really a course, as you know, it's a lab rotation. It's actually a joint uh, initiative, mostly with people from NUS, but there are a couple people from uh, US uh, TC in China, the University of Science and Technology. Um, and uh, basically we have two groups of students and guests joining us. We have people uh, in like yourselves in the 6101 group, uh, first year PhD students. We have a whole bunch of undergraduates who also uh, reported in, in, the, in the six groups um, who are doing it as a 4MC do it yourself module. Okay, so of course uh, they don't have as much experience as you guys do uh, doing uh, research work, uh, but this is their first attempt or maybe their second. Okay, we have some people not doing projects, uh, but just doing the lecture group and they come from my team. Uh, so this is basically an excuse for us to do a reading group. And, and we have a, a number of public guests. So uh, we heard from at least two of them today, um, their teams, uh, but sometimes we have uh, more. Okay, and there's a, again, because we cast this uh, segment on YouTube, there are uh, people who actually follow the class, surprisingly, uh, on YouTube. Okay, um, so for all of us uh, in 6101, basically you have two responsibilities, okay? Um, one is the projects and one is the lecturing. And the lecturing part uh, consists of two parts, okay? There's one where you actually have to present a lecture on a subject, 
and another one where you have to support the lecturing team. And support comes in various forms. So I'll talk about that a little later. Okay. Um, uh, this is similar for pretty much everyone else in the course. Okay. Uh, so our 6101 students inclusive of you guys have to do the group project. It has to amount to about 60 hours of work in total. And um, uh, the undergraduates doing it for uh, course credit actually have to do more than 60 hours of project work uh, because they are getting four MCs worth rather than your two MCs. Okay, so um, the explanation of what you need to do is if you've been uh, getting uh, buzzed by all of the, the Slack messages uh, that uh, uh, you have been notified about, it's basically that you have two different jobs. One is a lecturing duty. So for one week, you are asked to be part of the lecturing crew. So um, presenting part or whole of one paper. Okay, typically in one week, uh, we present around three to four papers um, that are very loosely tied to a particular area. So in the second half of the course, um, uh, for three sessions in a row, we'll be looking at conversational recommendation systems, which is a fairly new topic. I mean, it's been around for a long time, but there's been a lot of progress within the last three or four years. And so um, it's likely to be a little bit more coherent than um, uh, the previous part of the course, okay? It also means that uh, you have to inherit and learn a little bit about conversational systems and recommendation systems, which is why the first half of the course went through those, um, uh, again, sort of at a very basic and, and fundamental level, okay? So uh, when you lecture, basically your responsibility is to uh, work with the other lecturers to pick out uh, three or four papers that you want to cover, okay? Um, and then uh, decide who is lecturing which parts. So sometimes it might be good for two people to cover a single paper, by either sharing the duty, for example, one person can give the motivation, one person can give the experiments, one person might be uh, giving the model or, or uh, cutting it between, or you can do this in uh, what I recommend more, which is uh, some type of um, uh, 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 dialogue style where um, you know uh, both of you co-lecture the same parts, because otherwise it can get very boring to listen to slides. Okay, so it's, it's more fun this way. Okay, so um, again, don't try to spend a lot of time looking at the uh, experiments. Experiments and papers are rather boring for the most part because they just say something like, we did better than the other people who came before us. Okay, so what's interesting is when they have some discussion about why the model actually performs the way it does. So if you see those type of analysis sections, then feel free to present a little bit more detail on the experimental results. Otherwise, you can more or less skip the experimental results. Okay. Um, support means in some way of supporting and uh, complementing the lecturing staff. The one important thing that we do is contribute a, a bunch of uh, a Google Doc that summarizes uh, the material that's uh, covered in the lecture. Another thing that you can do is uh, help to pepper um, the session interactively by taking control of the Slack general channel, okay? And then uh, posing questions or posting uh, related links like uh, recent archive papers, cited papers, et cetera on that. And if you actually want to take up my suggestion, which is to actually have an interactive quiz, okay? Uh, we have the facility to do that. So uh, you can uh, work as a support member uh, with the rest of the team to come up with a bunch of questions, MCQ questions, ahead of time that we can, um, you, you guys can help uh, populate an online quiz in Kahoot, okay? Uh, which is a really nice way to get engagement. So um, it can uh, be very basic questions on the motivation or parts of the model. And then you can set maybe the two or three questions to ask on Kahoot. Um, and then everyone can have a chance to run that. Okay, interactivity takes time. So uh, if you do that, do budget it in, but it does keep people a, a little bit more occupied and it makes uh, memory retention much better than trying to stuff in lots of content. Okay, content stuffing is, is something that we wanna try to avoid as much as possible. Okay, um, so this is what uh, is basically happening by Tuesday of the week. Uh, what we want to do is ensure that you have decided on the core papers. I wrote here two to three, actually that's probably a better number than three to four. 
Okay, but I think most people go over about three papers because uh, we have usually about six people or so, so two people to a paper. Okay, assign one person to lead the coordination, okay, to make sure that the entire lecturing staff is on time for meeting the, the uh, timeline for getting ready for class. Okay, uh, estimate your lecture time to be uh, right about uh, 20 to 30 minutes, actually 10 to 20 is a bit short. Uh, but it, it's important to uh, get through uh, some of the motivation, okay? Um, especially if you're doing a whole lecture where there are several different approaches, it's good to have a summary at the end to say why these things are related to each other. Sometimes it's not very obvious. Okay, um, and then when lecturing, as you've seen some of the other students do, try Try to use your mouse or um, you know a, a stylus or something to support your lecture. Um, if you're using Zoom and your support staff, you can also do uh, you know some anno screen annotation to help um, make the points uh, clear. Okay, that's uh, really important. Okay, so um, yeah, you can choose a PDF format for your slides and then uh, use a stylus or finger. But I, I think the preferred format is to use Google Slides like this. Um, don't put them in uh, presentation format. This is usually not a good idea because um, you can actually see other people on the deck this way, okay? So um, when you publicize your material, you publicize your deck, then people can um, uh, in real time, you know, highlight things on, uh, on the screen that you will be able to see while you're lecturing, okay? So it's better to actually not use the presentation mode if you're using Google Slides. Okay, like I said, as the support role, you'll need to finalize the notes document uh, and then include uh, whatever comments come in the Zoom chat um, and on the uh, general channel and put them in the scribe document. Um, usually the week after the presentations are over, the uh, support team has to uh, fix up the document and make it presentable. And those uh, exist for the long term. So if you look at this uh, reading group's homepage, the 6101 uh, section's homepage, there are past versions of scribe notes that other people have done, okay? Um, also, we like to keep uh, the homepage of, of, for the reading group, this uh, brown homepage that you see, um, I think over here, yeah, this page needs to be kept up to date. So uh, you generally need to do a pull request to this page, which is uh, just all the stuff up here in order to make it um, up to date. Okay, yeah. And like I said, another thing you can do is do, um, you know, put in a quiz, you know. Okay, if you want to do that, just let me know. Um, I, I will, I'm all obviously on all of the preparatory channels uh, for each week. So um, I will give you the account password so that you can populate the quiz. Okay, so the timelines are, are pretty simple. Um, uh, week before uh, the lecture, so next week is week nine. That means on Tuesday of week nine, we need to have the paper list ready. So um, those of you who might be doing duties for week nine, you should already join the week nine preparation channel, okay, which you can find here. Okay, so if you uh, see this uh, screen, you come uh, to the channel section of your page in Slack, you'll see um, the one over here. So if you're uh, part of week nine, week 11, or week 13, which I think all of you must be a part of at least two weeks in this case, uh, please join the appropriate channel, okay? Um, and then after that, uh, basically, we have the reading group um, that's on uh, the Fridays, okay? Again, the project consultations are on Thursday because I have a conflicting meeting with my group on Friday. And then uh, on the Monday afterwards, we need to make sure the YouTube video is uh, done properly. So it's just neat. We don't actually clip the videos anymore. We just annotate them so that there are times in each section. And uh, by Friday, uh, the support group who are uh, doing the scribing needs to fix up all of the notes and then put the PR on the paper list and the links on the website so that everything is finished. Okay, so that's basically the lecturing duty. Now this week is uh, uh, not a lecture week, obviously, it's a project week. And so, uh, you know, there's a big project component for this lab rotation 
And so, as I said, you need to spend about 60 hours. Okay. Now you might be thinking, you know, 60 hours is a lot of time and I've got a lot of other courses to take. How can I manage that? Okay. Well, um, you have to try your best. You do need to keep a project log, uh, which is part of the slide decks that you see the other teams uh, creating. Okay. So I've already put um, a link on, on the project's channel, uh, which uh, you can take a look at for that, right? So if you go back to the project's channel, you'll see up uh, towards the front, uh, there are a number of these uh, tiles with the uh, project slides, okay? So you can look through the ones that are, are up there that come from uh, the sprint ideation or the ones that I have done something about the development, okay? So I'll just step through those in a, a minute or two, okay? But basically when you uh, present your work, uh, so next next week, so two weeks from now, uh, you guys uh, in 6101 uh, Lab Rotation 2 will need to come together uh, on the project channel to form groups, okay? So you can either do it uh, now uh, after uh, the formal time ends at uh, three o'clock. I'll stay on uh, and you guys are welcome to uh, dialogue with me, turn on your camera and introduce yourselves, okay? Then we can try to form project groups, okay? Um, and then, um, you know, work towards getting an idea of what your project might be. The goal is two weeks from now, you go through your ideation sprint. So uh, you'll see that I think uh, later on, I think I didn't put it up here. I'll, I'll get it in a minute or two, okay? Um, because you're in the second half of CS6101, uh, you don't have the chance to work with other team members like undergraduates or uh, uh, external members. So you guys will be a little bit more homogenous, which is both a good and a bad thing, okay? So uh, as you already know from today's session, we have these alternate Thursday uh, meetings where we check uh, a base with you and make sure that you're ready uh, to present and, and for you to have a little bit of pressure to decompose your project into meaningful two-week chunks, okay? So um, that that's all about that, okay? So uh, as I said, in week uh, 10, which is the next project consultation, uh, you'll need to accomplish this. You need to identify some team members that you're going to work with Okay, ideal team sizes should be uh, of at least two people. Okay, I don't want you to be doing a project by yourself. It's not healthy for you. Uh, it's better uh, for you to do work collaboratively. I mean, you're in NUS. NUS is a great uh, research school uh, by all accounts, if you believe the school rankings. I don't know who believes those things. But in any case, the whole point is that uh, when you work together, you're actually taking benefit from being in a university, right? If you're uh, alone and working on a project, well, you could do that anywhere, okay? You don't need to come to the university to do that, okay? So the ideal thing is to reach out using the projects channel, okay, um, like you have here, okay? Or, or better yet, you can use the SOC PhD year one channel, which you guys are all part of, right? I've added you all here, okay? And discuss, like, uh, maybe you can just take a round of introduction, you know, as I, I will do right now, you know, uh, I, I, you know, say say what type of person you are. So I'm an associate professor. I've been in here about 18 years. Uh, say a little bit about your interests. So I do natural language processing and IR, uh, but mostly I do uh, what, my students want okay not what i want to do okay my my own area of interest uh in digital libraries mostly uh so it's pretty far away from uh this reading group uh but uh, in any case uh then you can think about like which, which things uh, are of interest to you so uh the set of interests that you might have are in conversational systems recommendation systems or in conversational recommendation systems, okay? So you should pick one of these three areas that you're interested in or more than one, uh, and then uh, make it clear about what, what's interesting to you, okay? So you can just follow my lead there and then uh, you can just put up a post. So um, uh, just all of you can just write, write something there, okay? So uh, while you guys are doing that, I'll just mention a couple things in the ideation part. Okay, um, so I'm going to go back and look through the project deck and find the ideation slides. Okay, right here. I'm just going to add that to the tab. 
tab group. So when you do this, uh, again, the key information that you want uh, after you've established who you're going to work with is to find a paper uh, that you're going to modify, okay? Because the project is basically just to get your hands dirty and to try to do some experimentation, okay? So you identify uh, together with your teammate uh, one to two papers that you're very interested or curious about, okay? Um, and you uh, try to figure out um, the key metadata about it, right? So what's the code base that they use if they have a GitHub repository, it's a, a good sign that maybe that's helpful, okay? Um, because uh, again, when you have a base paper and you have code, uh, you, you have to do some quality assessment about whether that code is any good too. Okay, so just because you have a code base uh, helps a lot, but uh, code bases, of course, uh, vary a lot. Some of them are very well documented and industry uh, responsive, and some of them are just, you know, random PhD students who, who um, are doing things and not really concerned with their code base. They're really just doing it so that they can get their paper published because they've advertised that they have a, a, a code base available. Okay, so those are two different things. Okay, the other thing that you would want to note is that uh, you want to identify the data sets that people are using for this type of paper um, or uh, papers nearby, and then the evaluation metrics uh, related to this. Okay, so uh, once you've identified these base papers, you should do uh, what we call the forward and backward chaining, right? So forward chaining means looking at papers that come after this paper. So you go to something like Google Scholar or Semantic Scholar or Sightseer, you find the paper, you look at the papers that cite those papers, that particular paper, and then you try to look at those. And then again, try to identify whether there are code bases available for those papers, data sets available for those papers and evaluation metrics, okay? So you're trying to do sort of like your own graph convolution okay, over that paper that you've identified, you know, nearest neighbors, you know, two hops away or whatever, okay? So that you can have some idea about the, the data sets that people use, the evaluation metrics that paper use, okay? So that's your responsibility for um, next week, or uh, sorry, two weeks from now. But further on than that, uh, uh, you will need to work on the development sprint. So I think I cut off Wendy. So uh, do you have a question? Oh, no, I'm good. I just, uh, my network got some issues, so I log out and I log in again. <laughs> Sorry okay, for that. So, no problem at all. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'll just uh, keep on talking as lecturers like to do, just talk forever. Um, so if you look at the, the development sprint, which happens after the ideation, basically you'll have, I think, one to two development sprints, and then you'll need to finish up. So there'll be a reporting sprint uh, capstone at the end. Okay, so um, again, um, two, uh, about four weeks from now, you'll need to give a development sprint where you have to recap what you're doing so that pay, uh, people can re, uh, re have their um, memory jogged about it. Okay, and like you saw many of the slides today, uh, we asked you to conform to something like this slide deck. It doesn't have to be exactly like this, of course. Okay, but just to help you uh, think of the parameters that you have in mind. So what features, uh, did you get to work? Did you get your code, uh, the code base running? Um, did you uh, get any evaluation procedure running? Uh, if you get these two together uh, working, that's great because then it means that you have some estimation about how long it takes you to run uh, the training and testing process. Okay, this is really important because you really have a limited amount of time to do your project. You know, we're not targeting publications or venues that. Uh, conference venues or, or journal venues in this course, right? So uh, rather we're targeting, you know, week 13 to be done with your project, okay? So um, you, you can work backward from that time, uh, week 13 and say, okay, well, I, I need to get all the project training and, and the testing done. And so it's important to get the baseline done by let's say uh, week nine or 10, okay? Then uh, very important is that because a lot of machine learning and deep learning now is sort of black box, you know, it just happens to run without failing if the uh, matrices or vectors are the appropriate size, but it doesn't mean it's executing things properly. It means that you still need to do this part. You need to develop 
some type of test harness or test data that allows you to proof check that the model is actually running properly. If you don't do this uh, and you have a bug in your code, you won't know it, okay, until too late, okay? So um, yeah, I think at least one out of every 10 projects I hear, um, they say, oh, you know, we got the everything running, but then later on they realize they had a bug somewhere fundamental in their code, which uh, invalidates all of their work. Okay, so um, to do that, you can do some bulletproofing and make sure that you have um, this done. Okay, um, then for analysis, which is I, I'm a favorite fan of, is, is not to care so much about the model, but to care about the understanding behind the model, you should do some, some type of ablation test where you remove some components uh, of the model to check um, that your work is actually doing what it's supposed to do. Okay, and then along with your schedule, which we'll talk about later on, you need to be on target with respect to what you're supposed to do um, by that week. Okay, so um, when you uh, create your project slides, if you have your own code base uh, that you've cloned or forked to, please put that up. I have an idea about your evaluation metric and uh, which data sets or data set you're using and making sure that you uh, have a, a good idea of the encapsulation of the time it takes you to do training and, and testing, okay? Very importantly, if the data sets that are published are too big, don't try to take them all down, right? Uh, it would just be too much work. Uh, so uh, that's not the point of this course. It's the point is to get your hands dirty and to try doing something in this area, okay? Not to publish, okay? Although, of course, you find uh, good work uh, coming out of what you do, then uh, you're more than welcome to, to continue with it and try to publish the work, okay? Um, and then for each of the development sprints, uh, you'll need to think about how you're working towards the next uh, future stage, okay? So two weeks from now, what am I going to have done, okay? And then uh, towards the end, uh, it's like you saw some of the other groups do, try to ask or write down some questions that other people could weigh in on, okay? So um, uh, when you are listening to other people's presentations, do try to answer the questions that people have posed uh, for you, okay? So um, you might also uh, put up a schedule. Your schedule looks a little bit like this. So um, you need to know uh, which week uh, you're talking about. And uh, very crucially, because people's time pressures are different, you need to note down their availability, okay? like how many uh, days of the week that you have planned, right? So you have 20%, uh, that means out of five days, you have one day for you to work. Then uh, you might try to bunch that all in one day and, and make sure that your other team members are also available to work synchronously or asynchronously with you, okay? And um, that this will help you keep time. I think one of the other very important things that we want you to do out of a lab rotation is to experience what it's like to do a free form project. PhDs are pretty much as free form as it gets, okay? So to try to break it down into a, a manageable component means that you have to practice project uh, uh, management a lot, okay? That means, for example, estimating when things are going to get done in a realistic manner, um, then finding out whether you do it properly and then refining that estimate. So this is sort of like your own like project management reinforcement learning type of paradigm, right? Okay, you do this enough times, then you have a better sense of how long it takes you to do projects. And when you manage students yourselves, then you can manage them and say, yeah, you're being way too optimistic about how much time it's going to take you to get this done, okay? And then you can help them refine and, um, and uh, build their confidence rather than shake their confidence down, okay? So um, that's all I have for you right now. So uh, uh, let's go back to the project channel, okay? Um, sorry, SOC uh, PhD year one. And so I am going to invite all of you in the second lab rotation. Um, to uh, share your camera and video feeds. Um, do mind that it is uh, still a recorded session. So if you don't like to uh, show yourself on uh, YouTube, that's fine. You can keep your cameras off. But if you don't mind, it would be good uh, for you to share at least your audio and, and, and tell us a, a little bit about yourself. So on my screen, I have the following people who are still with us right now. I have uh, Chen Xing. Hi, Zihan, Hongfu, Li, Liu Yong, 
uh, Chao Rui, uh, Rofan, uh, Sam Broughton, uh, Wei Kong, uh, Wendy, and uh, Yi Song. Okay. So uh, we'll go in that particular order, Wendy. That means uh, you're close to last. <laughs> I hope you don't mind that. Okay. So um, Chen Xing, do you want to unmute and tell us a little bit about yourself? And then uh, after you have uh, done your audio a quick presentation for no more than a minute, I'd invite you to write something down in the um, uh, uh, SOC year one PhD channel. Uh, yeah. So my name is Wang Chengxin and currently I'm the first year PhD student and my supervisor is Prof. Gary Dan. Currently I'm working on a spatial temporal data modeling. Uh, specifically I'm in to predict the traffic flow of the city level. And um, I, that's all. Uh, okay. So maybe you can also say a little bit about what interest you have uh, with respect to projects. So um, are you interested in doing a recommendation systems project, a conversational systems project, or something in the intersection of conversational recommendation systems? Uh, so currently we uh, already have our work um, uh, as part of our work on cultural estimation pro uh, program, just uh, Yison has make a presentation on it. So we will continue to do this project in the following uh, springs. Right, okay, yeah. So Yi Song presented the, the work that you guys are doing on conversational systems. Okay, thanks very much, Chen Xing. Yeah, so okay. then uh, the next person is uh, Hai. So okay. Hai, are you there? No. Can you unmute? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So can you uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your interests? Okay, so uh, hello, I, uh, I'm Haiye. I'm the first year PhD student and I'm working with Profong and uh, uh, my current uh, research in interest is about QA and uh, some pre-training methods for preaching the language models. So, so actually I prefer to do some uh, pre-training methods uh, because, uh, because currently I uh, spend most of my time on this uh, project. So maybe, uh, yeah, maybe uh, it will make it the load uh, uh, smaller, yeah. Okay, yeah. So uh, if you're interested yeah. in pre-training, I mean, there are lots of places where pre-training and NLP and IR take place. So you can decide whether uh, you're going to deploy that, uh, you know, that very general methodology into something like um, a conversational system or a recommendation system. Okay, great. So uh, next oh, okay. we have uh, Zihan. Oh, hi. My name is Zuhan and my research area is Syrian optimization and Gaussian process. And I'm working with Prof. Jonathan Scarlett. And for the project, I don't have much background in NLP, but so far I'm more interested in recommendation system. Okay, great. So maybe a recommendation systems project, maybe something related to uh, your, your current work with uh, Jonathan Scarlett. Great. Okay, uh, Hong Fu is next. Um, hello everyone, I'm Hong Fu and my advisor is Professor Wang Ye and my research interest in, uh, is about the automatic speech recognition and based brain learning <coughs> and uh, um, for this elaboration I prefer to do some work on the conversational systems because it's kind of like um, um, it's um, not probably a totally NLP problem but I think it's like maybe we could um, use some uh, speaking and conversational systems. Yeah, I think that's maybe interesting, but I'm still in um, finding something to do. Yeah, that's all. Thank you all. Thanks all for that. Yeah, I think you're you're definitely right. You know, uh, you're part of the Sound and Music competing group with uh, Prof Wang, and uh, ASR definitely has uh, 
uh, and you know, um, uh, uh, speech generation has a lot to do with recommendation systems and conversational systems. So I welcome that. Yeah, great. Thanks. Okay, next we have Liu Yong. Hi, everyone. My name is Liu Yuan. Uh, for a PhD student at AOS, um, can play my um, interest um, in focus on high performance computing and machine learning. Mm, I think, I think uh, uh, well, do you have an interest to do a project in one of the free areas? Uh, um, currently, I think uh, considering a uh, system is an uh, interesting project. And uh, in the next, uh, I will try to do this project. Okay, great. Thanks for your introduction. So, uh, for those of you who are just coming in for your second lab rotation and don't have a lot of uh, um, uh, clear ideas about what to do, that's perfectly fine because I think some of you do have a very strong ideas of what you want to do. And that makes it easy for other people to gravitate and, and glue on to those projects. Um, so that, that's also very good, useful. Great, thanks, uh, Liu Yong. Then uh, after that, we have, uh, let's see, uh, I think we have uh, uh, Xiao uh, Rui, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Chao Rui. I'm a first year PhD student. Uh, my advisor is uh, Professor Brian Lowe. And my re research interests uh, include uh, Gaussian processes, uh, generative models, and something about uh, adversarial robustness. And for this project, I, uh, I prefer to do something about recommender systems, but uh, I don't, I have no objection on doing conversational systems because uh, Again, because my background is more from the mathematical side, so uh, maybe less about engineering. Yeah, that's great. So uh, I hear these two people are, are from the more Bayesian and math side of things, which is awesome. So uh, perhaps there's some shared uh, experience and ground to, to work on a project. Okay, thanks, uh, Chari. Okay, so um, Rofan, you're next. Uh, hello, Prof. My name is Liu Ruofan. I'm a first year CS PhD student, and my supervisor is Prof. Dong Jing Song. My current research direction is towards the combination of cybersecurity and computer vision techniques. So, specifically, I'm working on phishing detection using some computer vision model. And I don't have a particular preference for the type of project I'll do in this module. I think I'm okay with both conversational system or recommender system. Yeah, thanks, Prof. Okay, thank you so much for your self-introduction. Okay, and then I think we have Sam next, Sam? Uh, hello, um, so I'm a first year PhD student as well. Um, I'm actually from the UK. Um, still actually stuck in the UK, so there's a bit of a time difference going on there. Uh, and my main interests are um, so I'm a lot in the speech space as well. So I do a lot of voice conversion stuff. Um, so that's what I'm pretty interested about. Um, in terms of NLP, um, I've only done a little bit in the past before, uh, but I'd be more interested in the conversational side of things. Okay, so uh, maybe Sam and uh, Liu Yong, uh, both of you are in the same area, I think. So yeah, that I might be uh, a good idea to uh, touch base with each other and consider doing a project together on, uh, on, on conversational systems because you're both on, more on the speech side of things. Okay, great. Um, then we have Wei Chong. So I think you're the last student. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, so I'm a first year PhD student work, working under Dr. Uh, Prof. Liu Wei San. So I'm working on graph neural networks and also may possibly robotics. So I've yet to have a conversation about with him about where I want to pursue down the road. And with regards to the project, I am tending towards recommendation systems, yeah. Okay, great. So uh, now I think we've heard from everyone. Um, you know, like I said, we are recording this session. It will be put on YouTube on a public channel. So um, what I will ask you to do is if you uh, can spend maybe 
two or three minutes, just populating a short message about uh, yourself, repeating what you said um, into the first year uh, PhD uh, channel, the one that's uh, here. Uh, sorry, not this screen. Uh, let me see, where is it? Uh, yeah, over here. Um, then that would be great because then uh, there will be a placeholder for conversations, okay? Again, your objective over the next uh, two weeks, and you know you can just get it all done today if you'd like, is to establish a team member or two or three or four um, that you want to do together. Uh, obviously, the more people who do it together, the more coordination you have to do, but also the more likely that you get more cross-fertilization. I mean, that's the whole point of a lab rotation, really, is to get a chance to uh, talk with other people and work together. Okay, that's what it means to be doing research in a university. Okay, so um, once you do that, uh, you guys can then focus in on which papers you, you want to work on um, that might be a good fit. So try to identify within the next uh, two weeks after you establish the idea about your, your members of the team, who, uh, which papers might be interesting to you. Okay, especially many of you have interests in the recommendation systems and the conversational systems work. So then you can pick on any one of the, the six or so papers that have been covered in those uh, particular lectures to take a look at. And I think you've noticed over the last two hours that some of the teams are indeed doing exactly that. They're going through uh, papers uh, that have been presented uh, or that they have interests in, okay? Now, of course, for the lectures themselves, uh, you will be covering conversational recommendation systems paper. So it will be uh, sort of at the intersection. Uh, so it may be complementary, hopefully synergistic to, to whatever you're, you're doing um, uh, for your project. Okay, um, so that's all we have today. Um, uh, I look forward to seeing you next week uh, in week nine for our first lecture. So just a reminder again, for those of you who are on, um, uh, in our this side of the class, uh, you can visit this sheet, which is at this address, the uh, bit.ly 6101-lect capital choice, okay? Uh, it will take you to this Google worksheet uh, where your names are already ingested in, uh, in purple, okay? So they're all of you here, okay? And then what you need to do is, uh, I think we've already assigned most of you with the exception of uh, hi, okay? Um, which week you're working on. So you need to put a preference here if you don't have that. And then I will assign you actually to a week, okay? This uh, ordering and presentation is just so that we have a, a balanced number of presenters for each week. So uh, right now we have about seven to eight people responsible for weeks. So there's literally about 15 people uh, responsible for lecture each week uh, from weeks uh, nine through 13. Okay, um, and then uh, also on that uh, sheet, uh, you will have to declare your project. Okay, so once you have a project down, um, you can just uh, put your project group number here, or if you have a title, go ahead and put it in. And just make sure you call, uh, use the same string for all members of your group. Again, it's preferred very much that you don't work alone uh, so that you can uh, get to work with a, a fellow PhD student. Okay, so those are your two objectives uh, for uh, this coming week is to fill out um, the, the time schedule if, you're, if you haven't done that already. If you have done that, I've already assigned you a project group. So those of you with week nine, uh, either in the presenter or in the support column, uh, you guys will need to uh, make sure that you're uh, getting ready for your presentation. Okay, with that, I thank you. I'm sorry we ran over by 15 minutes, but uh, I hope uh, you have an idea of what to do. If you're not clear about that, just drop me a line on uh, Slack through the DM. Okay, thanks so much.